<laughs> we took an area of Rhodesia in the south that a visiting team of scientists headed by Lloyd Swift, an American, visiting the British, six British and former British territories, looking at range, etc. I was with that team, took them down there. In this area, I offered a five pound note, $10, if anybody could show me a single grass plant in a hundred mile drive. <laughs> okay, we were down to that. And I said to a big London-based company that had land there, they wanted me to advise them with 60,000 cows on a, over a million acres. And I said, I don't want it, you to take risk. Everybody in the world says I'm wrong. This is what I want to do, and I want to double your animals immediately. And so they gave me 4,000 acres of the worst land. They were blunt about it. They said, you can't bugger it up. It's already too far gone. Lloyd Swift, who headed that team, told us that it was technically beyond reclamation, was the words he used advising our government. Okay, so on that land, they gave me 4,000 acres, and I doubled the livestock immediately. I proved wrong, so I trebled them. And we produced solid perennial grassland. No range management, no grazing system, no reseeding, nothing but mimicking nature with the livestock and the planning process. And that produced solid perennial grassland. 12 inch rainfall, highly erratic. And we could not cause it to fail. We called it an advanced project, pushing it to try to produce failure, and we couldn't make it fail. So after that, we started letting it loose out further afield. That is a picture of the early days of apartheid South Africa, when there was a territory called Laboa. The cabinet of Laboa engaged me to help them, and in the far ground, that solid grassland, I got them to double the livestock numbers, plan the grazing, and we produced grassland. This is South Africa here, where they were jailing people for, for overstocking. Reseeding ranges, etc., turning to desert. That was 40 years ago. Now let's look at some land right next to us where Seth came and visited. This is land in our community. This is a typical bit of land at the end of the growing season. It's now going to go into eight months of no rain. This is the best it can be in the year. And this was taken with an Australian visitor on the same day. You're going to see same day pictures. And this was a particularly good rainfall year. That's a nearby cropland. And you can see the height the crop was grown to. This was a good rainfall year. That's what the land looked like. Every year now is flood, drought, flood, drought, perennial aid. Here are the pathetic few livestock that are blamed and have been blamed all my life and that we're trying to reduce. And here is one of their rivers dry at the end of the rains. And they are on perennial aid now, getting USAID and other food. Now, the day we took those pictures, we then came onto our land, same soil, same rainfall, and took that picture. Same day. We cannot keep pace with the production now. And on top of that, we can have anywhere up to 600 elephants on the place. We can have anywhere up to 500 buffalo on the place, <coughs> as well as our management herd of livestock, which is cattle, sheep, and goats. Okay. And we did that with really no other measure than curbing the fires and going up 400% in livestock numbers. And we use herding because we are operating with all that wildlife and with lions, cheetahs, wild dogs, hyenas, leopards, and we don't kill the predators. We run them in a predator-friendly manner. So they're herded, and at night they come into corrals that are portable and move easily with the animals. And just so that you see it, in the same land that you're looking there, the same, what we call flay, the same grassland, that was a picture I took in 87, before we got that going. We were about 90 whatever percent bare ground. Okay, let's look at some more of it. I know this land well because it's actually on a ranch that I donated to the community. Um, and um, 
So this ground was bare for ever. It was bare when I bought this ranch 30, 40 years ago, and this was on the road to my home. And no matter what the seasons, that ground was bare. Overrested land, same problem as worldwide. Okay. Now watch the tree, because you'll see the profound change as we do nothing other than break the rest and impact it very heavily with animals. Changes completely. Let's look at another scene. This is another bare bit of ground. Uh, again, similar story, been bare for years. You can see the exposed tree roots. Okay, so we've lost over a foot of soil, 25 centimeters of soil. They say one dime thickness of soil represents about 20 tons per acre. So you can work out, if you like, how much soil we've lost. Okay, so that, again, regardless of good or bad rain, that had continued in that state, just like the research plots, just like the research station. Here, watch the arrow, and you see the change as we impacted that very heavily with animals. Right? There's no question, and we just get this all the time. Every single site we do, and we have many of these, is different. Some it's, it's fungi that come in first, some it's something else. No two sites react the same, but all of them go from bare ground back to biodiversity, one way or another. We are getting to the embarrassing position now, we're running out of bare ground. We need bare ground for training purposes, because we bring people and we need about three square meters to do a little plot where we get people to pour the same amount of water at the same time onto covered soil, broken soil, capped soil. And then we watch it through the day and see, even the next day, the covered soil still got the water there, the other within half an hour is dry, etc. Just show what happens to water. So we need three square meters. This site we were using near my home, we can't use it now, it's now grossed over. And we're saying, what the hell, why didn't we think ahead to preserve <laughs> some bare ground for training purposes? What we are doing is, is preserving some bare ground for wildlife because we want to increase the whole biodiversity and these bare areas are terribly critical socially and so on for the giraffe, the zebra, the kudu, the, the many animals that come to them. This, this ground we are preserving it uh, bare. We've got several sites of them. We pick fairly flat ones that are not eroding and we keep them bare because they're so essential for the wildlife and we keep them bare by simply keeping the cattle off them. We just keep the management off, herd off them. And this site, it was interesting because when I had the senior research people and so on from Kruger Park a visit, okay, they got excited about this. They said, man, this is crazy that you guys are preserving bare ground for the wildlife and all the national parks, they're trying to heal it because there's so much of it. The amusing thing happened. We had some visitors in the hide sitting there to photograph game and three lions came and sat on top of it. <laughs> And they were petrified. <laughs> and as I said, a lot of game comes here, so we've preserved that. And then these are the Kruger National Park researchers, etc., visited and said. Uh, now, another uh, picture of, of change. If you watch this, this is in Mexico. And this is a tank dam where they made these with bulldozers to catch the runoff to water uh, cattle as the land gets dry and people try to harvest the rainfall. Watch the arrow. And you see that's exactly the same ground now. Okay, now that rain is going into the soil, staying in the soil. And an amusing thing happened, one of the neighbors of this rancher who we also worked with, uh, people visited him one day, and he was on the bulldozer filling in the tank dams. And they said, what the hell are you doing, Bill? Bill Fang was his name. And he said, I don't want to leave these as monuments to my stupidity <laughs> for my grandchildren. And he was filling them in. Yeah. And here you get the Karoo Desert in the Cape, and this is a family that I helped in the 70s, and that's uh, 200 millimeters of rain, highly erratic, just coming back to uh, desert, uh, from desert. Uh, this is my wife with some guests, sitting in an elephant hide, just constructed of cow dung and sand and rocks, but it's, it's solid enough that the elephants don't uh, uh, go for you. And you can photograph elephants as close as that. That elephant's about where Bill is from me. Wow. And you can just sit there and photograph them. 
And we did this at what we call elephant pools, where the pool of water was the only water we had, never gone dry. It was fed by a spring, and elephants would come there by the hundreds, okay, to water. Now there's the hide, you can see, and we've abandoned it. Now, we haven't abandoned it because we haven't got visitors and haven't got elephants. We've abandoned it simply because so few come now. Why are they not coming now? Because they've got water all over. And they've got water higher up the river. And uh, I took these pictures from Seth. This is elephant pools, uh, that pool where the hide was. And now, one and a half kilometers upstream from it, where it's been dry for all my life, never had rain. Uh, had water after eight months of dry. We now have permanent water, fish and water lilies. And as you drive up, it's water pretty well all the way. And what I love is we've now even got resident Egyptian geese. <laughs> the last four years, we've had resident geese all year after eight months of no rain. That, to me, that's exciting. <laughs> that's your biodiversity coming back. And nothing in the world can do it but much vilified livestock. <coughs> Here are two people that we work with down in Patagonia, uh, Pablo Borelli, Brian Marshall, an Australian. Brian trained with me for a uh, two-year period, and he's doing some wonderful work. He has trained Borelli, who's a, a researcher, ex-government extension person, range people. Uh, Pablo Borelli has kept wonderful data and, and so on of range just steadily turning to desert no matter what they did with conventional um, range uh, science thinking. And those folks now have put 25,000 sheep into one flock. And they got a measured 50% improvement in the production of the land in the first year. I long for the day we can see America's deserts turning around, the United States hopefully leading the world in this, instead of the desertifying America we look at today, and other countries following suit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.